Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Easy Conversations podcast, a podcast about having easy conversations, where we talk about mental health, adversity, spirituality, and societal issues. I'm your host, Furkan Dandia, and this week my guest is Sean Parker, and in this episode we delved into pressing societal issues such as the dark side of false allegations which have recently captivated public discourse and garnered significant attention. Our aim was to shed light on the potential harm inflicted on individuals and communities by addressing this complex issue's intricacies and consequences. In today's digital age, where information spreads like wildfire and the court of public opinion often presides before a proper investigation, false allegations have become contentious. Accusations of wrongdoing can have far-reaching implications affecting not only the lives of individuals falsely accused, but also the broader fabric of society. We must recognize the gravity of this phenomenon and its potential to tarnish reputations, undermine trust, and perpetuate injustice. We embarked on this journey with the aim to dissect the multifaceted nature of false allegations. Our exploration encompassed various dimensions including the motivations behind making false claims, the ripple effects on the accused and their loved ones, and the overall societal ramifications. Before releasing this episode, I went back and forth and consulted a couple of my mentors. My internal struggle was with coming across as taking sides. However, I also realized that the reason why I do this podcast is to share the story of others, but also give a voice to the people who often don't have one which is why I believe Sean Parker approached me. While I believe Me Too movement was needed because there were several men in positions of power who took advantage of their positions and abused women. Talking to Sean Parker made me realize that he's a genuine and authentic man who realizes and regrets the mistake he made. However, what I wanted the listeners to understand was Does the punishment fit the mistake? Sean Parker is an individual who is now fighting for false allegations and bringing this to light and attention to people who did not have that awareness. He's a British writer, artist, and academic in art, cultural theory, and justice reform. He lived in Istanbul for 10 years until 2014, where he lectured at Istanbul University and gave a TED Talk, Stammering and Creativity. He has published or contributed to several books, won six Kostler Arts Awards, and a Perry Lectures Essay Award in 2019. Parker is the editor of False Allegations Watch for the Empower the Innocent organization, which is based out of the University of Bristol. I really hope you get a lot out of this episode. And if at the end, if you could leave a review or comments in the comment section, I would truly appreciate it. Great, Sean. Welcome to the Easy Conversations podcast. Thank you for joining me today. I'm really excited to have this conversation with you today. And uh, and I'm grateful that you've taken the time to join me. But uh, before we get started, I want to give you an opportunity to introduce yourself and let the listeners know a little bit about your story, and then we'll kind of get into our conversation. Yeah. Thank you, Furkan. Um, Nice to be here. Um, I'm, um, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a writer and artist and, um, and a lecturer sometimes. And um, I'm here or talking to you about this because uh, in 2016, I was running an arts uh, center and the music venue on the South coast of England. And Mm -hmm. um, the Christmas of that year, uh, um, it's a long story, which of course we can go into. Um, right. I ended up being arrested at the high time of the Me Too movement, and 14 months later, um, going on trial and going to prison, and um, for reasons which I'm not guilty, and continuing to appeal and to um, do all kinds of things to fight. Right. Yeah. And and how long were you in prison for? Uh, for for uh, to four and a half years, four and a half years. And it's how long have you been? Sorry, what's that? Um, it, it, it's 
it's an eight and a half year sentence. Uh, but in England, everybody gets released halfway through to then do the rest of their sentence being checked in the community and that sort of thing. And um, yep. so they've changed that recently, but not before I was convicted. Okay. Okay. And how long have you been out for? Obviously, you're still serving your sentence in checked in, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, correct. I've been out since last May. 2022 so it's about back months is it something like that. okay well i mean yeah so do you want to share what happened and help us understand why you believe that you're not guilty sure thing um that art center well we had had um lots of customers um i was a bookings manager and also the managing director on paper and i possibly took on more than I sort of should have. Uh, there we are. That's history. But um, I was drinking my own bar, which is obviously, in retrospect, not a very good idea for anybody. But um, that's my own mitigation. Um, we, we had um, the, the person that was the complainant was a friend of mine and um, was an upholsterer, a customer of the place. But we chatted every day, that kind of thing. And um, in Christmas, a couple of days before Christmas spent sort of to 10 hours drinking together and then went to bed at the end of those 10 hours mm -hmm. in the morning um there was no force no violence nothing like that it was a very brief one night stand which is um either of us can barely remember but um right uh, her boyfriend who was applying to join the police at the time reported me it's a third party reporting the next day right. um to give this some context, if everyone goes, what, eight and a half years for that, um, what they did was they did to sexual assault charge to this, which was from six months before. On camera, it was caught a different friend who wasn't close to me. We didn't know each other properly. Also drunk, okay, acknowledged. We kissed each other, instigated by her. So um, that was caught on CCTV. But they put it together with this other thing, which is a plan that they were doing at the time to judge. To, to join the cases, to give them, them some more weight, basically. Mm -hmm. Alison Saunders was doing this to many men. And then not soon after that, she got deposed, not because of this, but for disclosure issues. So put together a very serious allegation with a very non-serious one to make, right. the, make the main allegation um, in a nutshell. So not much of a yeah. nutshell. Yeah, well, thanks for sharing all that. So, so you obviously think that, you know, this was fabricated case where it was mutual right the encounter was mutual you didn't force anything why is it important for you now to talk about this while you're obviously appealing your own case um because in the culture we can see right now after to johnny depp um after eleanor williams here who was just put away for eight and a half years herself for six counts of perverting the course of justice for making false allegations. False allegations are all over the place. And this is not about blaming the victim. Um, and it's not about believing the victim. It's mm -hmm. about the fact that the system is enabling anybody to make any complaint and to then upend people's lives. And this is happening to men all over the place. I say specifically men. Uh, I'm not particularly a sort of men's rights activist or anything as such. I don't identify with any such group. But it does seem to be happening to men as some sort of a plan to stop certain behaviours. The, the things that happen to people like me are very, very common in 9% of these kind of things. So most of them don't go to court outside of people like Alison Saunders, which is why mm. she was got rid of. Um, but when it's a serious thing, Mr. Wayne Cousins here is, in Britain is a massive case. He was a serving metropolitan police officer who... who uh, yeah raped and murdered young woman it was huge news it was a very distressing case and he's a what he's he's a one-off everyone says it's not just a bad apple well he was he's a bad apple in the police force and now he's gone to prison forever and right. um but they're conflating all of these sexual assault things which can be a touch on the bum up to something very very serious all to, putting it all together in the media and um lots of media have had enough of this which is interesting to see First time I've seen that for a long time. Right. Um, 
And how has it impacted you, right? Like you're obviously still serving your time, but what does this look like for you now to be able to even work or just in general your whole life? Um, it's had a difficult impact on work because because I'm a writer and I'm an arts guy. People don't usually expect this from for arts guys or people who are, you know, not, how do you put that? I don't have comorbid that kind of behaviors in my past and lots of people in my boat don't either. Um, the BBC got rid of all the radio plays that I used to have, um, got rid of it off their site without telling me uh, to TED. I had a TED talk up there. There was still a version out there, but they got rid of mine from their main site, which had 40,000 views on it. Right. It's a damn ring in creativity um, TED talk I gave. And um, lots of little organizations who were more indie also got rid of me, any reference to me without checking how it was, sort of checking my case, nothing. They just binned it. And that's why now it, I'm very, very passionate about cancel culture in academia and the arts. That's actually my main thing. Um, and it, because it's so destructively done, just binning people with right. asking what happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you've obviously been a victim of the cancel culture and, and obviously it's going to impact your life, even from a financial perspective. And mm. that's huge and i guess going back to the whole aspect of being able to speak up now why what are the what what are some of the things you're doing in terms of these fa false allegations and obviously you've already been impacted you can't change what's happened to you but it sounds like it's important for you to make sure it doesn't happen to other people yeah um people in my boat usually come out of prison Get, and just go and get on with their lives and sort of scuttle away, totally understandably, because because the weight of it is so heavy. What I'm doing is that I'm so cross with it, but not 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 in a uh, not in a victimizing way, just in a we need to talk about this, Kevin, kind of way, because it's just happening to many many people. Nobody, everyone, it's very difficult to get on the media. Not that I. Mm -hmm. That's not a name, you know. This this kind of conversation is good because we can expand and actually talk about it. But I know it will be packaged in a very different way on the mainstream media. And um, the, the fact is, there's something going on. And since 2010, since the Title IX thing was passed in America, we've imported all that stuff, and the Me Too stuff, and it's just piling on and on and on. Britain apparently is actually kind of quite good in the fight back. Or fight sounds so conflicty. I'm not a conflicty kind of guy, but we just need to right. express ourselves. And the freedom of speech is very, very important to artists and to anybody else. And um, when you've had a one night stand gone wrong or just contested or just um, perhaps, you know, you used to be too promiscuous or something like that, which mm -hmm. just happens on both sides of the sexual divide, but we're all being binned for it. Um, loads of people have had enough of it because it does right. destroy lives in it you know um just in answer to your other question there about what else am i doing i've become the editor of um false a a allegations watch um which is is an organization as a part of the empowering the innocent org here in britain uh, which operates right. out of the university of bristol dr michael norton is the expert on this subject and um he's uh kind of taking me on as the editor of this thing and we report on lots of cases from the states lots of cases from over here anybody who claims to have been a victim of a miscarriage of justice right so i guess that's what my next question was so you are working with someone in terms of doing this aspect of bringing false allegations to the public eye now just to give the listeners an idea of how many cases are we talking about here like how many cases have you seen roughly um the stuff that comes to false allegations watch is people that are kind of aggrieved and aggrieved to the point that they want to pursue and to publicize so it's a very small amount of a much bigger number who don't mm -hmm. do that and want to protect their families and whatnot um right kind of a, according to safari or the um sexual assault falsely accused research uh kind of initiative um, organization it's very 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 specific and Mm -hmm. For instance, um, a fifth of the people that come to them are 
kind of claiming innocence to some degree. So if that's 80,000 prisoners in Britain, that comes to 15,000 people. So any given time in the British prison system, it's about 15,000 who say something's gone wrong to the point of miscarriage of justice. Either right. I didn't do it or it wasn't how it's been portrayed. Um, but you won't hear from the media because they just go on what the court says. The mm -hmm. courts just do what the police say, what the CPS says, and which comes from a central narrative, which for 10 years has been believed the victim. Um, right. You know, started by Keir Starmer and operated by other directors of public prosecutions. So I'm quite um, boned up on all of this kind of info just because of what right. I've been through. I'm an arts guy. I don't talk about this stuff beforehand. But right. I put my brain yeah, and the concentration of being in prison onto this subject. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, just looking back, because obviously, like, I just want to get your perspective on it. But like, looking back, you know, you obviously put yourself in a situation where this happened. And to your point, it's it's not fair. And it's been taken completely out of context. What could you have done differently? And like, looking back, do you feel like maybe you could have handled those situations differently? And perhaps, is there a part of you that feels like maybe you shouldn't have put yourself in those situations? Like, is there any of that going on in your head? Oh, yeah. Yeah, man. Um, if you're inside, if you don't start to reflect on something and you're missing a trick, you know, because right. I am innocent as charged. However, you kind of go, well, why am I here too? And the fact is I don't drink anymore, um, mm -hmm. but not, not in an evangelical way, just the fact that it's very expensive and it's um, as you get older, when you drink, the outcomes are not always positive. You know, they get worse right. and worse as you get older, you get more argumentative and all kinds of things. Yeah. And this kind of misunderstanding can happen. And it's happened to lots of my customers at the venue. It's happened to many of my friends. And we just talk about it every day at work, you know. So um, I don't drink anymore. But, I mean, but, but I'm not abstinent. If there's a glass of wine, I'll have it. I just don't have it as an aim in life, which has been, right. been, been good. It's been a positive. And um, yeah. I, I I also think that there's something about kind of kind of um, I I intimacy issues, which I'm happy to acknowledge. If um if you have promiscuous sex to any degree of any gender, then there might be intimacy issues happening un underneath that. And I did used to be promiscuous. I'm not anymore, but there was too much of that going on now and again. But that does not equate rape or sexual assault, you know. So that's the problem here. Promiscuity is not that. But right. The radical feminists are making it that and that's, that's the danger right yeah yeah no and i appreciate that and i guess is there anything you want to alert men to when it comes to this stuff because obviously what, when you and i talked offline there's that there's that fear right for men that uh and i see it too especially with the younger men you kind of start thinking about okay what kind of situations do i not want to put myself into and there are consequences for some of the choices now you know, obviously socially promiscuity wasn't really an issue in the past, but now there is that fear, right? And whether you look at it from a moral perspective, perhaps it's not the right way of, to approach relationships anyways, but do you feel like there's a fear for men now? And, and what would you like to share on that side of things? Um, there is a fear out there, isn't there? And I don't want to add to that, um, but here we are, and it's, um, I don't think people should, you know, just should be living in a state of fear. It's the media responsible for that, and it's certain powers. Um, if they want to decriminalize promiscuity or to, to uh, decriminalize alcohol, there are big scopes for doing both of those things, um, but those shouldn't be the cases because promiscuity is, it's, is a life choice that people go through, and they usually right. go through stay there forever you know it's not a good look you have to in your 70s or or any other time necessarily it's, it's it's a journey you know um and the problem is these activists don't acknowledge the journey anymore they just do mm -hmm. good or bad right or wrong from their own perspective with thinking about the full um kind of color of kind of human life I'm not sure if i answered your question there but i tried to yeah no i think uh it is what you're saying is it is a part of life and you know we shouldn't live in fear because of the consequences that may be dictated by activists right 
you, you should be able to make choices in life based on what you think is right and wrong. And sometimes you just don't know any better. And, you know, you, you at certain points in your life, you do go down the hedonistic path and, and obviously you grow out of it, but it shouldn't be because that you're worried that you may go to jail for making certain choices in life, right? Obviously you, I mean, you have to have certain moral, you need to have a moral compass and live your life according to that. And obviously there's consequences for certain choices, but stuff like that, that's part of day to day life. There shouldn't be a fear of living it. Right. So I, I can understand that now going back to your case, you know, you obviously said it, there was a huge involvement from from the the lady's boyfriend, right? The person, your friend, or or whom you were friends with. What was the the individual's perspective on it? Was that ever brought to the table, or this was mainly driven by her boyfriend? Um. Well, I suppose I can talk about it now. was the boyfriend that did the reporting which only discovered sort of later on um mm -hmm. there are some aspects of the process which i can't go into too much because it's kind of sort of being dealt with right. under appeal as well um but third party reporting is a very tricky thing because it's just it's the weaponization of gossip it's not per person and then right. if they go to a sexual assault referral center afterwards called a sark here um then it's been proven basically the counselors there will say, Are you going to press charges? As, as if they're a policeman and the solicitors too, and the police people doing this as well, in like an effort to get up a sort of social narrative about this kind of thing. If you go to, an, to a SART, then they want to have, have a reason to continue to exist. And the reason right. to continue to exist is to have, to have the more cases. So the more cases mm -hmm. go and report him, you know, and um, as far as I'm aware, my complainant didn't want to, to, to report and she sort of said in court that, um, she didn't want to and the boyfriend said this as well. So it's, um, the thing is, there hasn't been any contact since then and um, right. so I don't have it any more except for what people have talked about here and there. Um, Worse. So, yeah, I'm not sure if, if I answered that. No, no, I think I, it makes sense, but I think it, the case was already made. And to your point, because this is a narrative that's being driven hard, they just ran with it, right? Oh, yes, yes, exactly. And I gave them the low hanging fruit at the time. It was high, high sort of, of the Me Too movement. The Harvey Weinstein was being arrested as I was on trial that week. So the jury going home, it's a nine woman, three man jury. Um, going home those nights watching Harvey Weinstein being taken down whilst they're going to go back in court to look at me. And um, I was advised on the third day to not speak because of my stammer. Um, the barrister said he didn't say this, but I heard him say it, and that's the reason I didn't speak. Uh, it could be seen as a sign of guilt. So yeah. I didn't get to give this kind of presentation in court, not that I've been able to, because the barristers twist your answers, you know. Um, but I stopped myself, stopped myself being represented properly on advice, which is utterly fatal. So if there's any advice for people watching, make sure you do speak in court if you uh, ever find yourself there. Yeah, so that's an interesting thing you've mentioned here. So you were told or advised not to speak to defend yourself in court. Hmm. And what was going on through your head to, to be able to comply with that? Uh, incredible stress <laughs> at that time. It's now sort of... Well, almost six years ago the five or six years ago um on the sunday before i was due to go into court i was in bed thinking right you're gonna have to speak you're gonna have to speak this is the time to speak this will so that they know what's happened and i was prepared for that prepared for it, but also receptive to what the barrister says because you feel that you're there unfairly anyway and you feel that, that they know sort of something that you don't so you go along with what they say and on the third day, um, the witness who was going to speak for me decided to not speak. And we had to pull him there. And then he decided to not speak. He went hostile. So that really deflated my barrister and it mm. de deflated our camp. And he said, oh, perhaps best not to speak. And I went, right, I'm not speaking then. 
and almost with a sense of relief, but also thinking I was chickening out. So if that's a term in, in the States, but, uh, you know, I kind of went from, yep. I'd feel obviously stupid about that now. I felt stupid in prison, but it's the choice I made then as a much heavier stammerer that, than I am now. Um, yeah, yeah. That time was more stressful. Right, right. No, I mean, I appreciate that. And so how are you coping with all of this? Obviously, you know, one of the things I focus on is mental health. How are you dealing with all of this? Obviously, the stress you've alluded to, but what's the coping style right now? Um, an acknowledgement that I put myself in positions. I put myself in that venue. I opened it. I got there. I drunk what I drunk. She drunk what she drunk. And I ended up where I ended up. So there is that. And you have to be a man. If to, well, We don't really say that anymore, do we? But you've got to be a man and, and front up to it. And that's what, what I did inside. Mm -hmm. um, if, if there's a benefit to prison, then it's not. There's a benefit. But um, there's a concentrated life. So at least you can kind of focus where you are. Mm -hmm. When you're innocent, you kind of go back to your core and go, well, who am I and how do I feel? And you're kind of tightening up. In a hostile way, not in a bad way, just in a um, what do I want to do now kind of way. It's like coming right. a grief in a way, isn't it? So um, I kind of honed everything and started. You know, I'm a writer anyway, and sort of inside I got a couple of books written and I just sort of published one about a month ago, which I'm now promoting. So I've got, I've got a lot of work and I did a lot of research into this area to mm -hmm. discover the Title IX things and all those imports we have. So... While it's a negative, I discovered many, many good artistic things and political things, and now I'm boned up on the subject of false allegations and spurious, spurious convictions too, which are more and more thousands of them. Right, right. So, so you've obviously been able to reflect and and be able to generate a lot of writing out of this, but. How are you dealing with your stress levels on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Because this must be taking a toll on your health. Are you keeping tabs on that? And and what are you what are the things you're doing to ensure, you know, your health, at least your mental health and your physical health are in check? I'll tell you what, um, it's an interesting one which which I haven't sort of been asked before. And um about sort of twenty years ago, I had a spell about 25 years ago, I had a spell of anxious depression after my dad died. Yeah. So I had sort of panic attacks, which became daily and which became its own anxious depression of questioning your sanity. I think I went bonkers really. And um, so for 10 years, I was trying to get better from that, from an awful, yeah. awful state of not being happy in your own head. So, which I guess is mental illness, but I, I wasn't, you couldn't tell. And the ex that I had at the time, which I lost, then because of basically being so screwed up um couldn't even express that to her you know so in time you start to understand what you have gone through then what i'm trying to say is that what i went through in prison and the trial doesn't compare to that because right. because there i was questioning myself which is that kind of i wouldn't want to ever say i was suicidal but mm -hmm. even thinking about suicide would give you a panic attack that sort of thing right. So you just become screwy. Um, but then with the prison thing, it's much more the state doing it to you. So it's not really internal. It went back right. into a second trust, which is myself, having got better from the anxious depression. So there's a comparison there over 20 years. And basically, that was much, much worse mm -hmm. than this thing, which is state imposed. And it's a thing you can do something with, which is what I'm doing now. You know, You can actually work on it, study it and go, hey, world, this is what's happening to some men. But with anxious depression, it's so internal and we're always going to have yeah. grief. Um, yeah. So in comparison, it's not as bad in a way. Yeah, yeah. So what you're saying is, did you actually have the tools to be able to deal with it this time because of your experience 20 years ago? And have you been using those tools? I guess that's the question. I think probably so. I can remember 20 years ago saying to myself, things will never be worse than this. So, you know, kind of, kind of hold on to this because it will never be this bad. And um, that's true. You know, 1999, something like that. 
So once prison happened and you're thinking, well, this is the worst possible thing anyone can imagine. And it sure is. Mm-hmm. It's the worst thing they can imagine doing to you as opposed right. to the worst thing that you've done to yourself, which mm-hmm. is the process of anxious depression and all those things, which I'm so happy I've left behind. I mean, you don't get better, you sit with it, but at least you know, you just come back to yourself, don't you? I come back to right. myself and I come back to myself after prison as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So what are the next steps look like for you? Like, what does the future look like? And where do you feel like you're headed with all of this? Um, that's, that's a good question. I have thought about that one. Uh, it's very cool to be able to speak to people like you and to your audience just in order to help. As you can tell, I've no hate in me. I've no malice. Mm-hmm. I've no, nothing like that. I've just got quite a lot of information and knowledge and hopefully a message that um, you can get through this um, as well if people find themselves in that boat. Um, yeah. The work I'm doing with Dr. Norton at University of Bristol there is very valuable. It's pretty unpopular in the criminology world because false allegations are very much against a certain narrative. It's against the whole fucking narrative, isn't it, really, of the mainstream media. Yeah. We constantly have a fight, but I'm used to a fight because of the stammer, because of uh, I've always been and have an independent mind. So I have my own view, sort of kind of opinions on things. So this is just another extension of that as a fairness. To believe the victims thing, if it was once fair or doing to doing, do address of the balance, isn't anymore. It just absolutely isn't. And you, of course, online, there's all these arguments between the rad femmes and the trans lobby and the men's rights and all that stuff. And I'm mm. always, always trying to be the neutral water between those to try and get something better than what we've got at the moment. You know? So yeah, would never use the word activist because because I'm a writer. I know what I am. I'm a writer and an artist and I'm very happy with that role. And I want to keep doing better writing. And um, just in the next couple of weeks, I think I've got an article in the in the National Review coming out or, or an interview or something. So, you know, which is the biggest sort of thing in America there, apparently. So it's sort of things very exciting to get the yeah. word out a little bit more in the most gentlemanly way possible. Yeah. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. And, and I guess as far as like being able to do art or put yourself out there again, what does that look like in the future? Like, do you feel like this is, this fight is something you're going to be doing for the rest of your life or at some point you hope to go back to some of the other things that you're more passionate about um, or, or maybe this is your passion now. I don't know. <laughs> uh, it's, it's just an aspect of what I do now because yeah. I write on um, sort of this book here is about the stammering and, and I published a book just last year, which I also wrote at Dartmoor prison about art because I'm a writer about art. So I still do all these things. I'm happy having those compartmentalizing. And mm-hmm. I think it's quite a, quite a positive thing. You know? And um, But I'm also kind of very happy to continue to talk about this kind of thing as much as people need it. I don't think it'll be the rest of your life sort of thing because at the moment, the conversation is coming to a place of what are we going to do about how mm-hmm. The media and society treat historically very serious sort of thing of sexual assault. Well, it's been democratized now. They say over here kind of criminalized, uh, decriminalized, but it hasn't been decriminalized at all. It's just been democratized. If you go into any pub in England, ask them openly who here has been sort of falsely accused of some domestic violence or sexual assault or something like coercive control, every other mm-hmm. guy's put his hand up because that is the state that we're in. And you just have to have a conversation on the street to have that of people being a bit more open about it. Um, right. And of course, that openness is is a risk to any uh, yeah. controlled narrative. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And yeah, I guess there's that whole risk. So how do you get past that, right? Because we talked about being cancelled in your case. How do you support men who are also being victimized in the same way to be able to speak up. And, and I guess that's part of the work you're doing, right? By being the model yourself. Yeah, I hope so. These people are unfairly um, quietened, exactly. Um, they get a, get a say and sort of thing is kind of overturned or quashed. Get to say their 
in a paper saying, isn't this an outrage, mm-hmm. is so much bigger than that. And um, with the False Allegations Watch, which is, um, if your viewers just go on to Google False Allegations Watch, they can see the sites in black and white. And I'm the editor of that. And we have lots of stories um, from Craig's sort of... To, S A U N D E R S, Craig Saunders in the United States, um, mm-hmm. uh, to people over here, people who got in contact with us, and we explore their story, explore their case. And as long as they're not blatantly lying, which really hasn't happened, you know, we put the case forward and say, and the more we have of these, the more it's clear there's a certain pattern of bundling things together, ignoring evidence, police working in cahoots with the courts in both countries. And the longer that goes on and the bigger it becomes, um, it's now being talked about in the Telegraph over here, a huge paper and the mail yep. on the GB News, Talk TV. Um, these, these sort of channels aren't heavily right wing. They're just free speech channels who have had enough of things like the BBC mm-hmm. and CNN. I don't know. So yeah. It's literally over there, but they've had enough of that kind of thing and going for an independent voice. And it's becoming very powerful. Yeah. <clears throat> and there's another thing you touched on because there is, you know, anytime, as you can appreciate, you've got the polarizing approach, right? With me too as well. But even in the work you're doing, how do you know and what are the things you're doing to make sure that people aren't coming in, playing the victim and taking advantage of the work you're doing? Um, if, if that happened, I would have a good conversation with. Dr. Norton, who's, you know, I'm in touch with him every day. He's got yeah. a, he's been doing this for 20 years. So he's very, very in depth with, and he's got a f- forensic mind. So he, he's an academic. So he goes into things that I wouldn't necessarily spot. I give things the glitz and the glamour and grammar. And, but he would do so in terms of a professional partnership, he will be all over that kind of thing. And he has sort of said, oh, we sure. But the thing is with false allegations, watch, it's not about saying, are you sure? innocent and guilty because that's a job for the courts who do so brilliantly at it what we do is we put the voice of people who are not heard elsewhere that's that's the, f- the freedom of speech thing which is so right. impassions me even if there's a chance that they did do it um just to give you a quick example mr clive queeman um is britain's oldest prisoner maintaining innocence he's been in since like 1988 and um mm-hmm. was convicted of killing he's a south african uh, from Zimbabwe, and he was convicted yeah. of killing someone then, 35 years ago, always maintained his innocence. And the amount of non-disclosure that's gone on is insane. And you just have to look at his thing. But the CCRC, the Criminal Cases Review Commission, refused to open his case again to say, this guy is clearly shouldn't be inside. And he's been in the right. longest. So there's that kind of thing that we look at too. It's not all sets cases. It's also the area of the things as well, just where things have gone wrong, which i he used to be a neighbor. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. So there's, there's all kinds of things where things have gone wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Sean, I mean, thank you for coming on here and sharing all of this. I really appreciate it. And how can listeners learn more about the work you're doing? I know you talked about the false allegations piece that they can find online, but what are some other ways they can find some of the work you're doing and, and look into it a little, a little bit more? Yes, thank you. Um, I've got a got a site on Amazon there, but that's about about my old work more than it's about art and music and a little bit of justice reform on my Amazon thing. Sean B W Parker, the false allegations watch is a good look, good sort of look, sort of the library of all the things we're talking about today, so they can go through all of that. Um, but I'm also a contributor to the New Thinking magazine, which is um, a very cool US site, uh, which is quite hot now to new thinking it's an orange site there and basically i'm very very busy with all kinds of um commissions and things and this aspect here though the focus of it will be on the false allegations watch but on youtube as well on um john bw parker youtube uh, i've got a bunch of, of the videos as well a c- couple of chats i've done like this where where i talk to the a voice for men um I was talking to the Justice for Men and Boys here, which is given to a voice for men in the US. So um, mm-hmm. those just went huge. So um, 
not dissimilar conversation about that is on there too. But the, the best place if you want to read about it and all the different cases we cover is False Allegations Watch. Okay. Well, thank you again, Sean. I really appreciate you coming on, sharing your story and good luck to the work you're doing. And, you know, I hope you are able to find a path here and it seems like you've been able to keep a level steady head. So that's always good to see. So, so thank you for sharing all of that. Thank you for your excellent questions. Very, very, very calm and well done. It's, it's a nice way to do media for sure. You know, <laughs> thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you for checking out this episode with Sean. Please leave a review or comments in the comment section. I love hearing from you. Or please subscribe to the podcast, which is the best way to support this podcast. And until next week.